clearly when you have someone who's a PhD in English who works in an engineering department, who has um, done all kinds of things from games to international development as it intersects with uh, information and communication technologies to about 10 other uh, careers that Beth has had in her short time uh, at the University of Washington <laughs> uh, and here at Berkman, um, no surprise that she would attract such, a, such an, interested, uh, an interesting group of folks. Um, we uh, first came to know Beth maybe 10 years ago? Oh my or God, something Wissis. like 10 years ago, Wissis, yes. uh, uh, Wissis uh, Geneva, mm -hmm. in my particular case, and uh, immediately identified a kindred spirit, um, someone that we were able to entice to come and spend a good deal of time uh, at Berkman. Uh, and so we're absolutely thrilled to have her back. And it's just what we're going to see at, uh, today. I, I don't actually know. I have not. I haven't been able to get through <laughs> these 68 pages of uh, book that she has. It's um, mostly pictures. But uh, um, what I would just say is that uh, it's a remarkable testament to what happens when you have a vision. You identify something that's interesting. You're not quite sure where it fits with your scholarship, perhaps, or even that it fits in a university setting. And you follow it anyway, recognizing <laughs> that there is something important in there. And you may not be able to immediately translate how these worlds uh, intersect. And I think, um, Beth, um, I don't know whether it's consciously or unconsciously, but has clearly uh, found that path. And I'm just thrilled that she's going to share some of that journey with us today. I'm just guessing. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, please. Thank you, Colin. That was a lovely intro. Uh, you could also call me a dilettante of all those different things. But um, yes, I think actually that's a really good characterization of what I'm going to do today, share with you a journey that I've been on. You could also call it the freedom of having been promoted. And so the university can give me no more promotions ever. So I can kind of do what I want, which is fun. So I am really excited to be here today. It's been, I think, three years since I've been to Berkman. And in those years, I've kind of had my head down, and I've been contemplating a lot of things. But one of the things, for at least for the purposes of today's talk, is that I've been thinking about hackers and makers and what they represent culturally. And I've been doing it in a very uh, meditative way rather than a uh, formalistic <clears throat> research way. I came to this topic through my daily life, not as a, as a researcher. and but because I'm an academic, it turned into research. So that's why I'm here today. And um, mostly I was curious. I was curious about activity that I saw when I spent time with hackers and makers in my local communities. It's been about six years of that. Um, and I was curious about the excitement of other people that I saw, namely, or specifically rather, people who have been wanting to harness the energy of the whole do-it-yourself movement and uh, for educational reform and also thinking about uh, general conversations about civic engagement and hackers and DIY. And I'm looking at this room and all the places that people come from, and I'm not really sure how to gauge the familiarity level and with the notion of hacker spaces and makers and DIY. So if those things are familiar to you, can you just indicate a little bit? Great. Okay. So I'm not going to spend time on definitions. And if you have questions at any point, please feel free to interrupt. Uh, if you want uh, definitions or clarifications, just let me know. But basically, I decided I was going to try to make sense of what I was seeing and what others were also clearly seeing and, and reacting to. And so that's that's what this presentation is about. Part of that sense making was setting out to write a book um, based on interviews with members of both communities, hackers and makers, in an attempt to better understand the nature of their activity and what might connect the groups. Um, so today, I'm going to give you a talk in three parts. I always like giving talks in three parts. And in the first one, I'm going to talk about hackers and makers and students, especially uh, undergrads, um, as innovators. And I'm going to pull um, both from interviews I've done for the book as well as a project I've been running at my university called Hackademia. In the second part of the talk, I'm going <laughs> to extract from uh, patterns I've seen within these non-expert communities, these communities that I am calling non-expert. Um, so let me give you a few words of what I mean by that. Basically, people who are not formally trained, okay, who are not credentialed, and so keep in mind that I'm coming at this from someone who's been in academia quite a while, and that's the that's the analytic lens in part. And there's so for people who are not recognized as an expert, there's an important distinction between self and society. So you may see yourself as an expert, but you may not be recognized as such um, by those around you. And so an individual who may have skills uh, that are internally recognized is not necessarily the person that uh, someone with resources might go to to solve a problem, okay? So if I have resources and I want to problem solve, where am I going to go? Am I going to go to these so-called non-experts? So as I mentioned, those first two parts are drawn from the book. I'm also I'm going to give you a little piece of some of the international uh, development stuff that, uh, that Colin mentioned, in, in part because it was 
my travel in the developing world that first got me really interested in the kind of creativity that you see at the grassroots level in terms of problem solving. Okay, so that second part, extracting those patterns um, from the, across non-expert communities, and then thinking about things that we can do as a society or as educators to scaffold and maximize those contributions. And then the third, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how and why I would wanna make more of this stuff, if you think of stuff as non-expert um, innovation. And uh, one of the reasons to identify the patterns within those communities is to try to drive my academia project a little more effectively. So there's also a surprise ending to the talk. Uh, it's not really a part four, it's more of an epilogue, but I, um, there is there is suspense. <laughs> yeah. So the, an important caveat before I start talking about some of these innovations is I'm not driving this from innovation theory. That's not where I started, which is, as an academic, kind of a weird thing. Um, instead, I'm taking a grounded theory approach to understanding the cultural production of hackers and makers. So that's sort of where all this comes from. So again, those non-experts as innovators, what, do, what exactly do I mean? Because again, trying to make sense of those communities. <clears throat> so lots of the excitement uh, and noise about hacker spaces as a source of educational reform. The idea of using making as a part, as a way to address curriculum, thinking about Make Magazine. Um, museum spaces, I was at a meeting in, in New York two weeks ago, I think, uh, at the New York Hall of Science about Learn, Make, Play. And the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy is involved as well, trying to figure out how to get um, <clears throat> reinvigorate education using uh, DIY and maker approaches. Uh, and sort of more and more museums are having maker spaces and having hands-on activities. Uh, but there's not a whole lot of concrete guidance on how to do that, at least within uh, post-secondary, within institutional, within uh, university settings. So when I get to the later part of my talk and I discuss hackademia, I'm gonna lay out those concrete steps that can be taken uh, to bring a little bit of a, the hacker space into the academy. Okay, so this is what I wanna learn about. I wanna learn about imagination and when it comes into play and the kind of game-changing inventions that can come from those uncredentialed ex uh, experts. So I did these interviews with people that I saw as creative problem solvers um, who bring their imagination to bear on problems and who really lack uh, credentials that um, we recognize in the academy and I wanted to know how are they going about <clears throat> solving problems and one of the other things that I do is I define them as rule breakers and that, I think that was in the blurb uh, for the talk and so let me tell you why I call them rule breakers uh, in part because of their lack of official expertise right so they break the rules of the academy um, but they also do break the law I mean there's actual law breaking that happens um, in those communities, particularly uh, hacker communities, you know. Um, but I, rule breaking is not necessarily a bad thing. So you can think about some of the uh, traditions of things like phone freaking and, and uh, the stealing that happened, but what came out of that? What were some of the valuable innovations that have come out of that? Uh, so reevaluating uh, re that notion of rule breaking. Um, and also rule breaking in business and thinking about disruptive technology, which I use as a framing mechanism despite I understand that there are flaws with that, but still a useful frame. So the other question is, why do I position hacker, hackers and makers together? So this is definitely, I'll be interested to see whether uh, this is an issue uh, in the room here, but it is an issue of contention with some people uh, about how do you put them in the same pot? Like, why would you do that? And um, there's an overlap in sort of physical membership. If you look at the people who participate in those communities in some cities, but it's certainly not um, a complete overlap. But basically, I had a hypothesis that, that drove me in trying to put them together. Um, I would say that happily, my hypothesis has been borne out, and that's some of what I'll uh, share. But the last uh, element of the rule breaking is thinking of it, thinking of it as a power play uh, because of the cultural and economic power associated with being technical. <coughs> trying not to cough into the mic. So, in this instance, it's because it's a matter of people claiming the ability to do things that formal expertise models exclude, right? And they're doing this work in the service of technical innovation. So my colleagues and I have been working with a six-themed categorization of being technical, that definition, that draws from learning theory, informal science, education literature, as well as cultural theories of agency. And there are six elements that we, I'll talk about these um, later in the talk in more detail, but basically thinking about self-efficacy, uh, as well as material technical practice, identity, conception, motivation, and social capital. And what's powerful here is that people who don't have the credentials to call themselves technical can choose to do so because of skills, and that culturally that's a powerful move because of the way we value technical expertise as well as you know how that plays out in terms of 
uh, jobs. If I say this to a group of hackers, by the way, they just stare at me blankly, but you know, not from within ha uh, academia. And so part of my goal is to identify and hopefully replicate these alternate pathways of becoming technical. And the way that I want to do that is this notion of functional engineers. So counterposing the idea of functional versus accredited engineers. So keep in mind that I teach in a college of engineering. And um, so there are certain expectations of what engineers are. And it is a little bit of a rule breaking, this idea of a functional engineer. Um, again, that will get picked up later. But the distinction is a driving force um, <clears throat> for the overall discussion. Because this is my dirty little secret. I don't actually care about formal STEM education. So science, technology, um, engineering, and math, STEM. I don't, OK, I care a little bit. But that's not what I'm trying to do with this project. There's a lot of energy and funding and really great researchers that are figuring out how to get more students to major in STEM fields and how to keep them in STEM fields. But that's not my goal with this work. Um, I want people to be STEM literate, okay? to be STEM facile. Um, they don't have to go to work as engineers or mathematical modelers. And in fact, if they don't go to work in those fields, I think it might be better because they might be able to approach future problems in more creative ways because their solutions are not going to be defined by what engineers think is possible. Okay? So despite appearances, this is not a hatchet job on academia. That's important. <laughs> I, I value the academy, um, but I want to make this distinction about really just looking at what happens when expertise isn't what leads to innovation. All right. So now I'm going to give you some examples. So can you ask me that question again at the end of the talk? Okay. Because I'm, when I talk about the Hackademia project, which is something I'm really trying to create as a sustainable model within higher education, I'm hoping that it'll bring the two things together. Okay. Hackers and makers, and you're distinguishing between them. Is your distinction that hackers work primarily on software and makers work primarily on physical objects? Um, not necessarily, no. And I actually avoid any kind of uh, outside definition of those communities. I'm much more interested in letting them define themselves. Okay, I just didn't know if that's the distinction, because that, that's not the line you're drawing. No. Okay. Mm -mm. I don't draw any firm lines, which is why I'm more interested in figuring out ways to clump them together. And I refer to habits of mind across the two communities. Um, <clears throat> uh, I was in, in RISD in November, and Jim made a, made a talk. <laughs> There, and he was talking about STEAM rather than STEM, mm -hmm. where he says science, technology, engineering, art, arts, and mathematics. And they are actually, um, they have some support from the legislative, their legislative community in Rhode Island to try and get the feds to start recognizing STEAM rather than STEM. So that's interesting. I heard that, I've, I've heard that acronym a couple of times. It also came up in the museum community that was at this meeting, which would make sense. So, and I think that that's also a push to be more explicit in the interdisciplinarity that's increasingly important for problem solving. It's in New York, uh, uh, the Contact Summit, and one of the project that was project that was funded there was the Fayetteville, New York hackerspace in their library. Uh. So MacArthur, along with the Institute for Museum and Library Studies. Um, in DC, so they, which is a federal agency, has funded a, an initiative to do just that. Um, and uh, you can see it as sort of the next step from having put computers into libraries, following on from that. OK, so there's way too many people in the room for me to actually do this. So instead, it's going to be a thought experiment. So this is something that came up in the workshop that I attended, uh, or the meeting that I attended a couple weeks ago. And it was a workshop led by a, a guy whose name I forget from, I believe, a museum in Minnesota. And he put a rope on the table, a circle, and he laid out cards that had numbers, uh, I think it was 1 through 17. And there were a group of, I believe, five of us. And he said, your task is to touch the numbers in order as quickly as you can. And there are three rules. Um, uh, when you begin, when you hit go on the timer, you have to be three feet away. Everyone has to be three feet away from the circle. Um, you, everyone has to participate, and there can only be one touch in the circle at a time. And what unfolded over the next, say, 15 or, 15 or 20 minutes as we worked on this uh, was incredibly instructive for thinking about the constraints we put on ourselves in terms of what are the rules. So the amount of work it took that group to go through, and there was another group doing it concurrently, and they actually had never, they never got to this point, to think, well, can we 
what can we actually do? Can we can we move the, the numbers? Can, do they have to be in this order because they were not in uh, numerical order? Can we change the shape of the circle? What does it mean for everyone to participate? Does everyone have to touch the numbers or can just one person do it to reduce time and everyone else shouts go? And just sort of deconstructing what those expectations of the rules were was really instructive. And that's, I think, it was an incredible lesson to how significantly our tacit assumptions, which we rarely articulate, constrain and um, those constraints define our behavior. But they're not actually real, they're just internalized. And so we constrain ourselves in thinking about what's possible. So this is a really good example. There might be someone in the room who knows more about this story than I do because I have not yet talked to, to these people. But uh, this was last summer. There was an independent inventor in Detroit who came up with a new way to harden steel. So he designed a flash heating process. So instead of heating it at a certain temperature for a long period of time, you heat it very quickly for a short period of time. And so it saves energy. Uh, and it makes it, I believe, 7% stronger. That was, that was the claim. And he eventually found his way to the University of Ohio. There's a center for metallurgy. And they're now working together to, to uh, verify and, and um, do all those good things with NSF money. But there's a great quote from the director of that center who says, you know, um, steel is what we would consider a mature science that people never actually would have thought about trying to make it better. We just figured as much had been done as could be done. Um, there's a similar. Uh, approach uh, in Seattle, uh, Wikispeed, group of people trying to build a car together. Um, this is an example, uh, Logos Electromechanical. So these, are, I'm giving you some, starting with some make examples here. Uh, I just really like saying the name of that company too. So Lo Logos Electromechanical is a small company. It's based in Seattle, and the the uh, the owner of it. He has a bachelor's degree in EE, so he's you know he's got some some official chops. And he had a job before he moved to Seattle building rockets in the desert. He was working on rockets, and he wanted some components for his work and for other projects, but they were really expensive. All that was available were these commercial components, uh, where he would have been paying for lots of gold plating or hardening things that he didn't need. And there were no options for kind of lightweight things. And at that point, he didn't have the electronics knowledge or the confidence to build those things himself. So he tells the story of after he moved to Seattle and he started hanging out at a, at a maker slash hacker space and talking to other people that the social process there made it easy for him to gain the knowledge that he needed pretty quickly, in fact. So I think it was 2008, towards the end of 2008, when he moved to Seattle. And by 2010, he had his first product. He says, I experimented and I burned my fingers a lot. I learned how to use Eagle to, to do the boards. Um, learning from other people, watching them, and um, getting advice from them. So this is another, um, well, this leads into the example. This is a, there's a party trick. I've never done it. Maybe someone here has, where you can get a wine cork out of a bottle without breaking the bottle. Has anyone ever done this? You can go watch this video on YouTube if you want. Without destroying the cork, without destroying the cork or the bottle. So what you do is you put a plastic bag in the bottle, you get it wrapped around the cork, and you blow a little air into it. And then you yank it. And perhaps counterintuitively, the cork comes out of the bottle. So there was an auto mechanic uh, named Odon, I believe in Argentina, sitting around a shop one afternoon watching videos with his friends. And he saw this. And I, I don't know why this is where his mind went, but he thought this would be a great way to get a baby out when you have obstructed labor. So the Odon device, currently in trial now, works very similarly. You have a thing, you, you put a suction cup on the baby's head when you have... Yeah. <laughs> have to see those definitions, they overlap. And uh, you slide a plastic bag over the baby's head and you blow air and then you can pull the baby out. And it does less damage than using forceps. It's incredibly inexpensive to produce and the fact is most women in the developing world give birth at home. And if there are complications, if you have obstructed labor, the like, there's a likely, very high likelihood that either you or your baby is going to die. So this is the kind of thing where it's in, if it works, as promised, it's inexpensive enough that you can put it into the safe birthing kits that they often give women to take home. It's something that midwives could carry. Uh, it potentially, uh, it, it has the potential to make a real difference in the world. All from watching YouTube videos. So all that wasted time in the afternoon could be uh, useful. Um, so now I'll talk about some more conventional hacker stuff. So the movie War Games, 1980s classic. I'm assuming most of you have seen it. Um, so there's a, the scene where Matthew Broderick takes, his, takes the phone and puts it into that cradle, runs a program, and it starts dialing numbers. 
and so it's random, randomly dialing, what's known as war dialing, and came from, the accounts differ about who uh, authored, who first authored uh, the, the actual war dial, war dialer that built upon uh, something called a demon dialer device, which would redial busy phone numbers until it got a ring. But basically, uh, war dialing uh, has been incorporated into business processes. Um, it became war driving with Wi-Fi networks, so you can see well-established companies um, using it to detect rogue access points within their uh, within their enterprising. Another version of it is with cell phones, and there's uh, so this sort of hackery tradition has been adapted for use in military situations with software that randomly calls cell phones um, in a, so it'll call every cell phone number in a given area at, at randomized time. So for example, if you're making an explosive device that relies on cell phones and your cell phone will ring at unexpected times, then that somewhat disincentivizes you from using that cell phone as part of your um, explosive device. There's a, uh, an, a guy who talks about this very eloquently, Peter Zlatko, he's, at, um, he's from Boston, so there may be people in the room who know him. He is currently a program officer at DARPA, and he's done this amazing thing where he, he has revolutionized how he's giving out money, recognizing that hackers, independent hackers, people who work together in hacker spaces have great ideas. And he's created a funding mechanism where if, even if you're an independent researcher, you fill out a very limited amount of paperwork, and from when you submit it to when you get your check, assuming it's approved, is five days. You get an answer within five days, which is sort of unheard of in a, in a US government agency. Um, and what he's trying to do is, similar to what I'm advocating here, is leveraging the expertise of, uh, of hackers. Uh, password crackers, that, um, again, uh, accounts are gonna vary, certainly from the people that I've talked to, accounts vary as to who's first to the punch, but uh, first, Consensus definitely that first uh, password cracking tools were authored by hackers. Um, they're the kind of thing that then spun into uh, part of a business process. As one of my interviewees said, um, you can't swing a cat online without finding a handful of companies that offer password cracking as a service. Um, if you think about exploit mitigations generally, um, most of those things, uh, you go to a hacker con, you look at the, the talks, um, those are the initial ideas coming out that later get integrated into uh, commercial software. So now I'm going to give you an example from my students. Right there, that third category of uh, non-experts coming up with ideas that can be interesting. So this is, I've been working with this team for about two years, a little over two years actually, um, to design a low-cost portable ultrasound system. And the, a colleague of mine in radiology came to me uh, maybe, oh, actually probably close to three years ago now, and he was starting a project. He was working with an institute in Kampala in Uganda to train midwives um, to use portable ultrasound machines. And they wanted to diagnose, they're doing a clinical trial, diagnose three conditions that contribute to the majority of uh, maternal mortality, infection and, um, and death. So he approached me originally because he was like, oh, well, I, I, someone told me I was gonna need some cross-cultural expertise and they said I should talk to you. And I was like, well, yeah, you might. And then what happened is they started training the midwives, other issues emerged. So here in the US, if you are trained to be a sonographer, you will go to school for two years. That's the normal training. Um, they were running this program with a, a fantastic training, um, with a fantastic organization based in Kampala. They were training the midwives for anywhere from two to six weeks. And they were finding that it was challenging for them to learn uh, the theory of sonography as well as using the machine effectively. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, <laughs> A little bit unfair, but. Uh, so this is a commercial portable ultrasound machine and you can see the complexity there. So it's got lots of user interface elements um, and lots of features to help you diagnose conditions in multiple types of domains. And these midwives are only doing obstetric, obviously. You can see uh, a row of soft buttons. You can see sliders off to the side. Uh, there's a keyboard as well as a trackball. There's some extra buttons. There's a scroll wheel. And then over here, um, below on, I guess you're right, you can see labels that were added by hospital staff. So if you go into a sonography room, often you'll see little uh, labels remind, so that the sonographers use to remind themselves about what, they, what buttons are for. Sometimes they'll put tape over buttons to remind themselves not to use those buttons because there's just way too much going on than they actually need. 
So the question posed to us was, can you come up with a simpler solution? And that's what, that's what the students came up with. So that probe is made by a company called Interson. It uses older technology. It uses me its mechanical sector ultrasound. The image quality is much poorer than what you would get uh, in, a, in a contemporary machine. The question was, is it good enough to diagnose those three conditions? Uh, and then they just used off-the-shelf uh, off uh, uh, netbook. You eventually upgraded to um, a, a laptop. And then they worked on the UI. So the, the back-end software had been developed by um, the signal processing and all that stuff had been done by researchers at Washington University, not University of Washington. Um, but we worked on the user interface. And what the students did was they were like, well, what do we actually need to do? And so they had the idea, well, let's go talk to the midwives and ask them what they need to do. Um, and let's test some things out with them. And let's look at the context of care that they're working in. And then they got really crazy and they said, let's go talk to the midwives or the mothers. Let's actually talk to the patients who will be on the other side of that device and see whether there are misconceptions, um, whether there's fears of the technology, like what can we learn from them to help us design a better machine? So they did some of that work. Uh, they had them do some design ethnography activities. Uh, and then one of the things that they came up with was a help system, which uh, is different than what you will find in most. I can't say all because I have not looked at every commercial ultrasound machine. Uh, but most of the help systems within ultrasound machines are about using it. Okay? And what we learned is that these midwives, they're working in these clinics and they're often the only practitioner. So if you go to a hospital here and you go to a radiology read reading room, the radiologist will be there. And then maybe the referring physician will come in to look at the images. And if it's a teaching hospital, there'll be some fellows and some residents. But there's a lot of people in the context of care. And so if there's something that you're not sure of, it's very easy to turn and ask someone, well, what do you think about this? What are you seeing here? Contrast that with the working conditions of the midwives. They were sort of out there, uh, no access to internet, spotty cell phone connection, and often the only midwife on shift. And so the idea behind the help system they built was, well, let's simplify things, so reduce the sliders down to what's only necessary. But then let's also create an in-context help system that is also a learning system. So defining things, um, creating step-by-step uh, -step sort of guidelines, um, having it so that you can listen to things, uh, you can listen to the help text instead of reading it if you care to. Um, there's playback, so you can take videos, and then there's uh, also side-by-side -side image comparison. So this is what you're trying to capture. This is what your scan currently looks like. You know, work on getting them to match. So what I would say is that, whoops, not understanding the boundaries of the problem space allowed the students to come up with a new solution. Okay, it never occurred to them that you couldn't build that learning system into the portable machine that the midwives would be using, and so they did it, which was pretty innovative. So as I mentioned, I spend a lot of time researching um, in different parts of the world. This is somewhere in Central Asia. And uh, I came to see just an increasing pattern of people coming up with sometimes super really simple solutions, like how do you use a technology, you know, group uh, sharing a technology. Uh, sometimes things that are slightly more complicated, uh, recreating a, a public phone system. And I just have been fascinated by this for years. So that's what I'm trying to look at those, those uh, resonances across the different communities. So the second thing that I'm going to talk about is patterns that I've seen across these non-expert communities. And what enables hackers and makers to do their innovative work? And are there things that we can do uh, to scaffold and maximize those contributions? So I started by saying, well, let's look at habits of mind across these, these four areas. So hacker spaces and maker spaces, and I'm not drawing firm distinctions uh, between those two. Uh, there are really interesting gender issues that come up when you try to try to go there. Uh, going to hacker conferences, going to a few maker fairs, um, and I, and also doing the inter the interviews with individual uh, hackers and makers. And so three patterns emerged. I'll just tell you punchline right now: um, the importance of actual space, uh, the idea of apprenticeship, so some kind of scaffolded learning, and then finally reputation building opportunities, which take the form of contests across both communities. So in terms of community spaces, just really having that physical gathering space. And so most of you raised your hand when you said you were familiar with the hackerspace and makerspace um, stuff. So I'm not going to go ahead and, and spend any time defining that. But basically, some place, um, they're not all open. Some are closed communities. But having that physical gathering space so you can have that um, opportunistic gathering and learning, 
that physical, physicality is important. In terms of apprenticeship with an emphasis on education, this takes the place of, it can take the place rather of uh, workshops, sort of formal stuff. It, it can also be like uh, the story of um, the Logos Electromechanical, where someone shows up into a community, they don't really know what they need to know, they start hanging out, helping other people with their projects and through that process learning. And then the final is ways, contests, um, or other ways to build reputation. So if you go to, say, DEF CON, Capture the Flag is a hugely important contest. But there are many, many, many other contests um, at uh, DEF CON, including lock picking. Uh, it's a huge conference, and the talks fill up. You've got to line up like 20 minutes ahead of time to get into a talk. So what else are you going to do? Take part in one of these um, contests. Or, or, or we're drinking. There's a lot of drinking. It is Vegas. Um, but it's really just there's just a ton going on. Um, and the educational components of it are, so some of the interviews that I did, some of the uh, old, sort of hackers who've been around for a long time really pinpointed DEF CON as one of the transitional moments. They were sort of the first con to really start doing workshops and having a focus on education and, and um, that kind of thing. So from the maker side, you can go to the Instructables website, uh, which is one of the places where people put up their projects. And they, are, they constantly have, um, have contests there. But what happens in both of these sites is if you uh, participate in a contest and you do something awesome, you get reputation that's identified by the community. So in, the, in terms of DEF CON, if you win Capture the Flag, you get a black badge, gives you free entry, I think for life, I'm not really sure, but you have your black badge to wear at the next uh, DEF CON and people know you won that contest. In Instructables, uh, your, um, your ID on the site reflects the fact that you have um, earned badges, either honorable mentions or won contests. And so you get that reputation built um, across both of the communities so you can have recognition. So what also became apparent to me um, is that both communities are research communities, right? But the work was under different kinds of constraints than what I see um, in academic or industry research environments. And again, framing this coming from an academic perspective, the issue of constraints was really interesting to me. So I thought about what are the multiple research communities that produce innovations? There's universities, there's industry labs, there's um, independent researchers. But I would say, before you get too attached to this model as uh, correct or incorrect, you know, it might be this one. Um, it could also be this one. I don't really know. And uh, that's someone else's research to figure out. That's not what I'm trying to do here. Um, because I do know about this, and I know that the world of NSF dominates that kind of work. But I really want to focus on these independent researchers and uh, learn about the kind of work that they're doing, which seemed different to me. So if we go back to that ultrasound example that I gave you a few minutes ago, I was really deep into that project before someone tossed the term uh, disruptive technology at me. And that's when I started thinking and going back over what I'd learned about hacker and maker communities and, and puzzled over what at that point I was calling habits of mind okay, across these two communities. How do I bring them together? And so I did a little bit of reading and I looked at some of the sort of very s kind of simple definitions of disruptive technologies in terms of having less functionality and being less expensive and um, appealing to new user communities. And I thought about the constraints that academic researchers face. And I'd spent a little bit of time at an industry research lab and thinking about some of, some of what happened there. And it became particularly acute to me in thinking about that less functionality within an academic research community. So there, is, there are very substantive disincentives to doing things that are disruptive in academia from a research perspective. So if you do something that is not new research or new knowledge, you're not going to get a grant to it, and no one is going to get a PhD dissertation out of it. I mean, it's a structural disincentive. From an industry perspective, if you're trying to make something that's less expensive, how do you justify your R&D dollars? Um, one of the lessons that we've learned from the ultrasound project and talking to many different ultrasound manufacturers is that cheaper technologies, uh, there's a disincentive to produce them because they don't necessarily fit into existing sales structures. So sales is a component of what makes uh, what what go, feeds into the cost of a certain technology. Um, and so there, there's all these great ideas that just kind of languish. And if I go to conferences in the ICT and development space, there's lots of really great ideas that never really go anywhere or don't necessarily scale up. And then thinking about new user communities, um, what do you do about advertising works really differently? And I'm thinking globally here. I'm thinking about sort of traditional bottom of the pyramid marketing. Um, how do you come up with different manufacturing and distribution strategies that would be necessary to reach those communities in a cost-effective way? And then all the difficulties with high volume and uh, low margin being challenging. So this is a framework that I'm starting with, and I, I actually really hope to get some feedback here. 
because again, it's me trying to make sense of those patterns coming out of the interviews as well as uh, fieldwork and, and educational experiments. So one of my um, one of my interviewees defined a hacker. He said that a hacker is a person who's immune to frustration. But that's the definition. It just doesn't bother some people to be frustrated. They just keep looking at a problem. And I really, I like that definition, thinking about how that can drive a new perspective. So part of coming out of that, what I just showed and thinking about ultrasound and some of the other stuff, is this idea of a technology remix. Because you're not going to get necessarily sort of cutting edge research in a traditional sense coming out of something that's not well funded, right? New nanomaterials are going to come out of in academic or industry labs. There's lots that, that can be done now where you have um, sort of cheaper research tools. Uh, biohacking is a really good example. But what about the innovations of using older technology in, in new ways to solve problems in new ways? And that's sort of where things are. And I think about some of the projects that um, some of the folks I've worked with as well as other communities with which I'm familiar and this is, um, this is sending a balloon up into near space. And there's a panorama of cameras there that someone's working on. So then they sitting in that little foam box. And then they go up. And then you, know, you end up with a picture like this um, of the Earth from near space. There's nothing actually new. There's not technology development happening there. But there's some interesting remixing happening, certainly on the photography side. But you also set the stage for someone to learn the skills that they need to then go do something like Logos Electromechanical which is producing components that other people can then use to build things like a balance bot or other uh, kinds of things. Yes? Balloon photography for, for informal mapping of informal communities, principally, I believe, in Latin America. I think I've heard of that. And then I don't know if they're working in conjunction with some of the people in Seattle, but they're also um, coming up with a kind of a, a balloon Wi-Fi disaster kit where you can send it up and have coverage um, using some of that uh, technology. OK, so the last part, and this is where I may or may not answer your question. We'll see about academia, why it's not a hatchet job. It might be. I'm willing to entertain that thought. Um, but I want to create more pathways to innovation by creating pathways for people to gain functional engineering skills. Right? So what I've done is, uh, in, in driving towards this notion of a functional engineer, created what I'm calling a semi-formal learning environment. So it's not formal. It's not a traditional classroom setting. Uh, it's also not informal. It's not an after-school setting. Uh, it ha it's, it's a room. So basically, I have a room. We started out by squatting for a year, and then we got kicked out, and then someone gave us a room. And so it's, we, I've got a desk. I've got some chairs. I took the chairs out of my own office and put them in there, uh, which keeps my meetings really short because everyone has to stand, which is really great. Uh, and it's stocked with stuff that I've scavenged. Um, so I had a little bit of money for a while left over from something, bought some Arduinos and things like that, and now it's self-funded, which is, um, makes scavenging very important. And um, so I tell the students to just to find a project, figure out something they want to do, and then learn the skills, keep track of how they learn. They blog about it. Um, I provide. Uh, so I don't provide any instruction in terms of the skills. What I do is I give them, uh, I help them scope their projects, I help them manage leadership roles, and I help point them to the resources that can guide them. Um, but I'm not doing formal instruction. Um, and what I also do is I create those um, apprenticeship models from within the group. So I figure out who knows what and um, pair them up that way. Say, so, you know, for your first task to do this, you want to work with this person right here. I haven't done anything yet with the sort of reputation building in terms of contests, but uh, that'll be the next step. So I know that we need to give people basic skills. We need to give them some knowledge so they can have that different perspective and potentially be an innovator. And so I see Hackademia as about creating that potential, um, creating potentially awesome innovators or people who have the ability to make awesome contributions. Um, not, I don't expect um, some fantastic innovation to come out of a 10-week project. Maybe someday it will, uh, but that's not actually what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to give people that kind of technical literacy and create pathways both for community engagement and lifelong learning. So that was our very first group. And that first group, what they did is we bought a MakerBot, which was an early 3D, well, uh, early 3D printer as a kit. And I said, put it together and then f keep track of how you put it together, because I didn't know how to do it. And it was all on a wiki, and so they, they figured it out very slowly. They came from different backgrounds. Um, and they kept track of how they learned. These are some of the research methods that we used in that. Because again, so I've spent two years 
10 weeks, 10 weeks, 10 weeks. I think there have been seven groups now. And um, I kind of let them twist in the wind a little bit to see where things go wrong. But that's part of me figuring out how to do it better. And they, they know what they're signing up for. This is from just a, a random quote from the blog that they kept that first group. But so they said, this is the true story of six strangers uh, picked to inhabit a windowless room and have their lives taped to find out what happens when people stop being polite and start building a MakerBot. And so we had a, some interesting project outcomes. There, I mean, also some lovely anecdotes. Uh, like when the, when, the, when the kit first arrived and we were, un, we were doing the unboxing and there was a young woman in the class and, or in the group and, and I said, well, don't you, don't you want to help? And she had picked up the camera and she said, no, I don't want to touch it, I'll break it. I'll just take pictures. And so she, just, she took pictures. And about three weeks later, some people can build these in seven hours. We took our time and sped it out over weeks. Um, about three weeks later, I guess, we're working on something, and uh, there were four of the same piece that you had to put together. And so she's working on like the second, and then I go to work on the third, and she she literally slaps my hand away, and she's like, "No, no, I got it." So that was that was nice. And um, and there was another woman in the group who uh, actually she'd signed up for the group not because she wanted to participate in that; she actually wanted to work with me on my global health stuff, but I didn't know that. So she ended up in the MakerBot group, and uh, so she was not technical at all. But at the end, she was very proud of the fact that she was going to build her own computer and had fixed her own vacuum cleaner. And that correlates to some of those pilot project outcomes that we identified. So reporting increased confidence when faced with technical problems. Again, taking these non-technical learners and trying to give them basic technical skills. But, and so they, you know, the idea of hands-on experience rather than formal instruction, that was important. But the third one is one of the things that I found most interesting is that they no longer perceive themselves this idea of being inherently technical or non-technical broke down for them. So they would say, when we had, sort of did an exit interview, they like, well, before I would think that someone who was in, say, EE or ME, um, electrical engineering or mechanical engineering, that they were somehow born that way, that they were technical you know, from the outset. But it turns out, no, I mean, I could do this too. I just actually don't want to. I want to do this other stuff. But the, the breakdown of um, that sense of in inherent nature was really interesting to see. They also started articulating their own identity and their access to social capital differently, um, recognizing those as, in, particularly the social capital piece as an important element um, to gaining technical skills. For me, that's a, a really promising in terms of lifelong learning. Um, so connecting them up to resources in the community outside of the institution is a big component of what I do. So I'm not, again, I'm trying to work with university students not K-12. And one of the things that, that's really interesting to me, at least at my university, I've taught at three different universities and, and I, I've seen this at each of them, but by the time someone is say 20 or 21 and they've chosen their major and they're on a non-technical pathway, there are very few mechanisms at the university for them to gain some technical skills. And so what I'm trying to do is create those opportunities in a way, in that semi-formal educational way. So someone who's <laughs> not on an engineering track, but they're, they get to a point in their life like, well, maybe, you know, maybe it would be good to be able to solder. I don't know why. Someone gave me something for Christmas and I have to solder. Um, that this is a, a pathway. It's an alternate pathway um, for people who don't, who've somehow gotten themselves off that track. Because we have very few ways for them to get back on that track, even for that functional uh, literacy. So this is uh, the sign on my lab. Our tagline is creating functional engineers one blinky LED at a time. Because there is something magical about making an LED blink the first time if you've never ever thought of yourself as having any electronic skills. Um, yeah, I should have brought boards and we could have done a little blinky workshop, yeah. Okay, so this notion of what does it mean to be technical, these, let me go back to those six dimensions that I mentioned at the beginning. So the self-efficacy, this is some of the literature, it's not comprehensive, but this is some of the literature that we're drawing from. Um, again, learning theory, um, informal science education, and some social theory as well. Uh, so building on social and material epistemological frameworks, um, the material technical practice that's coming out of some of the work that the, for, out of the National Research Council is one of my colleagues in education uh, works on informal science learning. And so he uh, partnered with us in putting together, helping to put together these, these, these dimensions of being technical and pulls from uh, his NRC book as well. Um, so basically, you know, learning to solder, gaining technical skills, and then this notion of identity formation and understanding the back and forth between self and social, and that that identity is also uh, malleable. That notion of conception, so understanding the scope and the practices of technical knowledge. So what what even constitutes technical knowledge? And this is 
This is driven, uh, another one of the activities that I'm doing with people in the lab, which is putting together short videos, um, introducing concepts and vocabulary and tools. Uh, again, trying to highlight the tacit knowledge. So if you don't know, I don't know, if you don't know what soldering is, how do you ever learn what soldering is? Or if you don't know what a ball peen hammer is, don't know where to point one out to you, really, how do we learn those things? It is, right? it's, it turns out it's an incredible barrier, basic vocabulary. So we're trying to do just kind of short videos. And then motivation, uh, that I, I could have a future self that's different. Um, and then the social capital, which I mentioned. So I'd sort of send them out and I make them talk to people outside the university. So as I mentioned, that the importance of vocabulary, we get at that through videos and blogging, the hands-on learning, reflection as part of our process, and then the community collaboration. So I'm lucky in Seattle, there's lots of um, hacker and maker spaces for them to go to. So just to revisit, um, also I'm, I'm constitutionally incapable of having a presentation without a lolcat in it, um, but physical space, apprenticeship, and the opportunities to build reputation um, as part of what drives this. So. Again, to reiterate, I am not trying to turn everyone into a STEM or major. That's not what I'm doing. I want those thousand functional engineers to bloom. I want people to have the self-efficacy to call themselves technical, to create, not just consume, to be able to sit around a table with people of vastly different backgrounds, including people who are much more technical than they are, and still participate in a conversation and generate potentially disruptive or game-changing technologies. That's, that's what I'm trying to do with this project. And indeed, no one knows tomorrow and I will say that, so I worked on this book for a few months, and I thought, well, this is really great, and it's really wonderful to write about people making things and changing stuff, but I'd actually really rather just change stuff. So um, I know I don't have a finished book, um, but I have a company, and so that's my surprise ending. Uh, and it's an engineering and manufacturing company, and I'm working exclusively with hackers. I'm not working, well, Actually, one of the co-founders does have a PhD in BioE, but I know her through the hacking community. Um, and so I would say, you know, putting money where my scholarship is, literally. Uh, and so we're doing engineering and man innovative manufacturing and distribution. Uh, we're doing low-cost devices, uh, starting in the global health space, because Seattle's a great place to do that. And a bunch of us have experience in the global health space. Uh, and doing both in-house R&D, we have two prototypes now, but also trying to find some of those great innovations that have come up that people have, people have created uh, and finding ways to manufacture them using emerging technologies and distribute them in innovative ways. So uh, yeah, that's how my talk ends. And who knows where it'll go from there. So the acknowledgments are really important and I'm sure I left lots of people out, but the you know, and again, I got to say, this did not start as research. This was just my life for the last six years, but it became so interesting. I had to talk about it in other ways. So the people at DEF CON and SHMUCON and TORCON especially have been really helpful. Uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation supported the Midwives Ultrasound Project that I talked about. And then those are some of the people that have helped their uh, colleagues at the U. And then I'm going to give a shout out for a guy named Neil O'Farrell, who I've never met but he owned the hackademia.com uh, domain. And I'd come up with the name in, uh, I think my friend Bree Pettis helped me with the name. We were brainstorming one night and I emailed, so I emailed him out of the blue and I was like, um, I see you've been sitting on this for 10 years and there's nothing here. I'm an academic, I don't have a lot of money, but maybe I could give you a hundred dollars. And he said, oh, it sounds like what you're doing is great. I'll just give it to you. So thank you, Neil. <laughs> so I am uh, happy to take questions, um, including whether you still think this is a hatchet job. No, I, I see your point. So it's, you, you have these ossified structures, which uh, academia is a part of, and you're focusing on something that these ossified structures are very poor at doing. But you're not saying that they, they're not good at other things. Yes. And so, you know, that's fine. Yeah. yeah. That's a, but that's exactly right. Is they, academia is really good at some things, and I, the thing that I love about being an academic, but I just, I see this whole other way of knowing and being in the world being ignored by those institutions. And, you know, just because you didn't figure it out when you were 15 that you might want to do something technical, it doesn't seem like we can't still talk to you. So. You have a back channel question. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, Is it a nice one? It says, mm -hmm. I, I think so, so. In her experience, how would she scale hacking as a cultural practice? How to create a culture of hacking that grows and flourishes? In parentheses, Seattle already has a technical culture in its reign. Yeah, that's a, that, that is a good question. So if you go to, I think it's hackerspaces.org, there's a list of, I mean, probably close to a thousand now, hackerspaces around the world. And 
they do pop up in the strangest of places. How you scale, I don't have an answer for that one. I'm still working on the acad academia thing. Um, but I, I think that's one of the ways that, I can't believe I'm going to say this, but um, some of the sort of distributed knowledge practices of the internet can help. So Dale Dougherty of Make Magazine is working really hard to, like one of the things he really wants to figure out is how you can connect these isolated communities um, using uh, using the internet, I mean, using distributed resources. But I think if you tap in, so a lot of this isn't new, right? So there were always, like there were trained hobbyists, there were always tinkerers, popular mechanics. So I think if there's a way to sort of tap into that community in these more isolated places that don't have the same kind of tradition that Seattle does, that that might be a way to grow local culture. Cool. Hi. Uh, I was going to ask about motivation. I was kind of surprised by the hacker who reported that hackers don't get really frustrated because one of the proverbial maxims is hackers scratch itches, and itches are, in a sense, an irritation. You think, look at this, this is kind of stupid or broken, and I could do it better. So, in, in fact, annoyance and frustration can be one of the key motivations. And then translating that into the academic context, what seems to motivate students for the most part is not to get a bad grade. In fact, to get a good grade, which makes them very unwilling to experiment, makes them very risk averse. And so I wondered if you graded your students on their hacker projects and how so, because I think that is really the big divide between a hacker space and a classroom. The one you're doing for intrinsic motivation, the other potentially you're doing it for the extrinsic motivation, and we know that extrinsic tends to inhibit in intrinsic. So that's a great question. Then I'm going to do the second part first. So that's why it's semi-formal and it's not formal. I don't grade them, it's pass-fail. And I, I say very specifically, all you need to do to get your credit is define something you want to learn, learn it, and tell me how you learn it, like blog about how you learn it. And as long as they do that, like it doesn't matter if they fail. They can fail and still get credit. And I have had student projects fail, absolutely. So I showed a slide of one of those with the, uh, it was an IR project that we tried to do. Didn't, it totally did not come to fruition. Uh, so, but I think, so I, I think that's one of the, why I, I like the term semi-formal, because I don't think it would work in a formal classroom environment, because you're absolutely right about them being risk averse. Um, in terms of the hackers, that's also a good point. I think, well, from that interview, he wasn't talking about, I would call that curiosity, the sort of seeing something that like, well, that's really lousy, I bet I could make that better. That's a kind of, it is a frustration on one level, but I would also reframe it as curiosity. The frustration he was trying to talk about comes like at the level of debugging. Like, I can sit and stare at this problem for, many, 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 many hours, days, weeks. I'm going to figure it out. And that's the kind of uh, frustration level he was saying the hackers could tolerate. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Beth, thanks for the great talk. It's really inspiring. Do you have some ideas about, or are you interested at all in integration? Because you get to the point of literacy, and literacy for people who come from a non-technical background. But is there any space that you're seeing of integration or these two cultures um, meeting? So I would hope so. In my in my <coughs> advertisement blurb that I send out now to students, I talk about CP. Like I think I have a CP Snow quote in there about the the two cultures and trying to specifically draw students from the humanities and put them in a room with students who might have more technical background and seeing what happens. I sort of need more experiments about that. I I also really want to I want to do things both looking at well gender obviously right. Anytime you're talking about technical stuff. I want to do more with um, class, race, and intergenerational. So I had written an NSF proposal that didn't get funded. Thank God, I have to say, thank God. It's one of those things where it's not where I wanted to go. It's not where I would have, I would not have found that direction gratifying with the project. It would have been scaling up too quickly. But one of the things I really liked about it was this notion of outreach. So Seattle has um, some very strong uh, pockets of recent immigrants, so working with community centers um, I had a partner with a senior center working with them as well and trying to get that kind of cross-cultural um, back and forth going. I think that would be really interesting. You haven't done any real experiments there yet, but you're really interested to see. Yeah, I am really interested. I mean, honestly, this is a side project for me. Like, all of my real research ah. is in global health, so, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't know if you have seen the site uh, thereifixedit.com. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It, it has kind of this, and, and each one of us who has at some point uh, owned a house 
has <laughs> found the skills Ooh, of I hacking. I should go there for some ideas. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I can tell you how I spend my uh, vacation. Uh, <laughs> What's the site again? So, there I fixed it. There I fixed it. There I fixed it. There I fixed it. Yes. So, in an earlier version of this talk, I had a slide with there I fixed it dot com, Afragadget, yeah. and I forget one other link of sites that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. the 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 faucet breaking just before the party starts <laughs> calls for. Remembering my father who said never throw away every little piece of metal or plastic that comes to you and, and it, he was right. Is your picture on the website? No, no, I haven't put it. It, it is too embarrassing even for the reference. <laughs> but uh, one thing I noticed is that you're trying to bring some uh, respect to this community in academia who have been, you know, looking at those hackers in a kind of more distant way. But it reminds me of the way that, uh, you know, true scientists have been treating engineers for a long time. Because, you know, for scientists, engineers were those who didn't ex exactly understand science, but they were trying to slap it together. And now these hackers are, are you know, present themselves to engineers as those people who don't exactly know how to do it, but they try. It's, it's an interesting kind of metaphor, I think, of how things develop. That's a great insight, because I think that that, that technology remix which, by the way, like I had, I got interviewed last week about this project, and, and they asked a question about hackers and music and stuff, and and that was where I thought, well, maybe this is remix, but it's like even more applied, you know, it's like, so the infinite regression of the dirtiness of applied. Thank you. Um, one thing I noticed about the Hope Conference that, uh, in 2010 is that it sort of became a very political event. There were still the technical talks, but if you sort of were reporting on the conference, you would, the thing you would notice would be the controversy over WikiLeaks and whether Julian Assange would speak and all the sort of the political speech from the tour people and everything. So I wonder if you see that as a trend in the community or if that's just an anomalous event or if you saw how would that change things? I wouldn't say that I see it as a trend across the whole hacker community. I think hacker cons have distinct personalities. Um, so, and I've never been to Hope. Um, certainly there's that thread uh, of political engagement and uh, particularly when it comes to security and some of the international issues in terms of censorship. Um, but I don't, I'm, I'm sort of running through in my head of the different communities whose cons I participated in. I don't, I don't see it as a universal uh, theme that dominates. Yeah. Um. Cory Doctorow's book, Makers, is an interesting scenario for the near-term future. And obviously you know it, but it would be interesting to look at that in relationship to what you're doing and how it might project forward. There's also, at the same time, this great explosion in the craft community, which is a little bit different from hackers, certainly different from hackers, and, and a little bit different from makers. Um, part of that is because of Etsy and other things, but I don't think yarn bombing would have taken off without some of the hacker stuff happening, without some of the political things behind hacking and making happening. There's also, this also seems to me to be a part of, of the old stream of appropriate technology, mm -hmm. of Mr. Fuller's design science, and um, the relocalization movement. And it, as someone who's been involved in, in alternative agriculture, local agriculture for 30 years, it's taken 30 years for people to recognize that, that we've built an alternative economic structure that's a base. And it's not only a base for farmers, but it's a base for, can be a base for a lot of these things certainly in terms of craft food and production like that, but also in terms of crafts and making and, you know, spaces that are open to all of these other more technical, quote unquote, mm -hmm. ideas. So I'll just pick up on a couple yeah. things there. Um, so this notion of returning to, say, appropriate technology literature, that there are older streams of conversation here. Um, so one of the one of the claims that uh, some of my subjects have made is this notion of, well, the idea of making you know, across domains is really just a resurgence, that actually the last 20 years has been a generational blip of consumption and that we're returning to older cultural practices. Um, there's, I think, a lot of richness there. That's, not, it's, that's just outside of my scope. I can't, I can't go that far. But it's, um, 
it's certainly a theme that resonates um, with me. And in terms of the appropriate technology literature per se, that's something that I make my students read all the time because there's some really ter terrific examples there. I think actually the ICTD community might benefit from some uh, uh, golden oldies there. And then the you know the craft thing, the craft make. Uh, boy, there's a lot of there's a lot to be said there in terms of gendered the way that uh, technology is gendered. And um, Petrovsky has these intro to engineering books for students. Um, I forget, is it Henry Petrovsky? Uh, and he, you know, he talks about how sewing is engineering and cookies, co cooking is engineering if you look at them as actual practices. But because of the, our expectations about technology, they sort of fall off the table. And so that's part of the kind of reincorporating of different communities into these, uh, into these practices and seeing oneself as technical. What practices do you already engage in that could be seen that way? Um, so when Make Magazine started publishing craft and as a companion piece, I think there was some, uh, there was, there were some voices of dissension there that separating them out reinforce some gender boundaries. And my, my understanding is they no longer publish uh, craft. But if you go, like if you go to a Maker Faire, they have the craft people, you know, cordoned off <laughs> in, their own, <laughs> in their own pen. So. And there are great labs, I mean, at MIT, at Berkeley, of students working on um, really terrific low tech stuff. So, is there a hand over here? Talk. I really Thanks. love all this stuff. Um, I'm trying to decide which of the many questions I have I want to ask. <laughs> um, one of them that connects the best and sort of the connecting the communities. And I think, in a certain way, I think what's really interesting that you're seeing is that is the attitudes outside of the <coughs> university and kind of the cultural way of working is actually what you're defining as being one of the most valuable things that a university could try to now start to offer to students. In, in part, is the technology, but it's sort of like the attitude that comes with that way of working mm -hmm. in these communities. And then, so your experience isn't actually trying to make connections across, like, so creating this environment within the university, but these students and then their exposure and access and to participation in the extra university maker community. So, and I think that's where the definition of expertise can become such poison, because students are taught to respect certain kinds of expertise, mm -hmm. and so there's a boundary then to availing themselves of the resources that are in their community and are available to them. And yet there's all this talk of like the importance of lifelong learning. Mm -hmm. And so that's, you're right, I am, I'm trying to just sort of recognize those pathways that already exist and say, you know, go over there, go over there. But I'm, well, I get, maybe I'm, so like, like here, very concretely in Boston, there's a series of maker spaces of people mm -hmm. that don't have academic backgrounds. Some people maybe from undergrad in the community, but they're not academics in any way. And those communities don't interact very much with people that maybe have very similar sensibilities inside the university. Why do you think that is? I think it's because in part the university, even with people of a similar sensibility inside the university creating an environment like the one you're describing at Washington, mm -hmm. there's something that happens when it's in a university and there's students versus people that are outside of the university. And that I'm just curious if you're experience with that, because I think it's a really interesting challenge. But I think actually that making those connections socially is potentially one of the highest benefits that this type of activity can have. So the first time I gave this talk at my university, I was terrified. It was a couple months ago. Because I felt like I was going to be perceived as doing a hatchet job. Um, there, yeah, I mean, I completely agree with you. And it is always astonishing to me when I'm moving around in the communities outside of the academy, and then I run into someone I might know. It's most evident to me when researchers, when graduate students who are doing research at the university end up giving talks in some of these community forums. Because mm -hmm. I was there for years before any, anyone would, would showed up to give the first, say, presentation on their computer science research mm -hmm. outside of the university. Um, the, I'm trying, I'm, moderating my words carefully. I am mindful of that camera. Um, so maybe we could just talk about this later. So again, thank you for the talk. And I'm totally on board with, with you know, the general direction. I just want to make two kind of uh, notes. They're like side, side notes. Is one, what's interesting to me, the, the difference between metallurgy, let's say, and um, computer science. Uh, so metallurgy, as you said, there's kind of a very high barrier of entry. Mm -hmm. Beside be, besides being a mature science, it's kind of difficult to get it going at home. Uh, you can do a lot with a microwave, though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and I think that has just structurally resulted in, in the kind of pecking community being much less 
kind of stratified in terms of uh, uh, credentials and, and so on. So, uh, you know, when I worked for a software company, like 50% of the people who worked with me, 50% of the engineers had degrees in English, history, and so on. So that's kind of a, there's a natural af affinity there uh, for di discreditation. Of it. Sure. Um, Let's discredit them. So, so that's one. And the second thing is, I'm, I'm, I've been also thinking a lot about this: how to introduce this maker culture, hacking culture, into academia. And I love that you, you kind of, I think, packaged it very nicely in a way that somebody who is not familiar mm -hmm. with this space would kind of, perhaps, understand. So this okay. is great. Great. I'd that's love what my to hope. Talk to you more about it. Great. Um, but I think the kind of uh, a, a slight problem there is that. Uh, there's there's no uh, usually in the in the classroom there's ver very little continuity of, of the community so you you know you, the class comes together as this group for a semester and then it disappears the students come together for four years and then they disappear so these badges right this kind of social the, the, any cultural capital that they gain uh, dissipates with that with the uh, <coughs> transience of the community whereas the the these conventions, mm -hmm. they you know, they, they keep them forever and so on. Uh, so I think it's worthwhile to think about how to counteract this structural problem. How do we create a sense of a community that goes beyond the classroom, beyond the four years and so on? So that's just my two. Yeah. Uh, so it's a great point. I, I, the, the Pollyanna in me will say if you create a project that's compelling enough, then the students will continue on. I mean, I have to say with that ultrasound project, the students continued long after. Yeah. They, some of them had already graduated, they didn't get credit, they didn't get paid, they just worked on it for a couple of years. But, because it was very compelling to them, it meant a lot. Um, but that notion of transiency, particularly the sort of temporary identity of being a university student, I think that's really key, and you're right, that's something that I haven't addressed. I think that there's uh, potential, given, given the blogs, given the online version of what they're doing, to have a, some kind of persistent identity that will carry beyond you know, the four years, either you know, the 10 weeks of being in the group or the four years of being a student, particularly once they get linked up to the larger community. And it might be worthwhile for me to think about uh, creating that persistent identity, not just within the group at the U, but creating those connect connections, those online connections with the community as well, so that their, the identity that they build within their group is a de facto identity within that larger community. So, thank you. Are we done? There's one more direct channel. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, one more. Um, uh, in a similar light to Scott's question, uh, that was the last one, okay. uh, what might be the cultural or societal barriers to overcome in order to inspire the hacker ethos? You may have covered that, I'm not sure. The cultural or societal barriers to... Over, to, to overcome in order to inspire the hacker ethos. So, okay, I think part of it is the perception of hackers as, you know, somehow bad. There's so much discourse. <coughs> There's lots of other people working on that as well. Um, uh, from the perspective of the participants, I think that's where the notion of being able to claim a technical identity comes into play. Mm -hmm. So, and 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 then just you know tearing down those those barriers between self and other, and thinking about those communities as disconnected from oneself, or disconnected from the university, or disconnected from one's major or one's profession, and starting to see those connections. That would be that'd be how I start. Cool. All right. With that, please join me in thanking Beth. Thank you very much.